so so I so I think structurally so so yes we have seen fathers are more engaged they are more involved and part of that um involvement I mean if you just think of this you know the street scene um 30 years ago even you know 40 years ago to see men out and about with kids um you know wheeling buggies and and doing all that stuff it is just not unusual now and yet it used to be I mean we just see many more practices of fathering going on out there in the public sphere um these might still be choreographed by the mothers and by that I mean they're saying I'll take the you know go and do this or go and collect that so I think again it's this um having an opportunity to feel um in the position of a primary carer, even in a couple relationship. So, so the question in lots of ways comes down to, can we equally share caring uh, in ways that um, enable both parents who are both so important, whether that is in a couple household or whether that's separated parents, you know, kids deserve to have both their parents in their lives, if that's possible. Um, so, and, and one of the other really significant changes, though, I think that we've seen um, related to involvement, but which is also sort of structural in some way, is a greater understanding in relation to gender and masculinities. So we've moved very much from an understanding in a language of masculinity as singular, and you know the real man and the man, the male breadwinner, and all of those sort of very narrow ideas of what it is to be a man, to a, a much greater understanding fortunately through a lot of sociologists work, but um, Ray Wynne Connell in particular, um, who have really opened up the category of masculinities and you can be a man in a whole range of ways that might be um, you know, very emotionally expressive, very caring, um, all of those sorts of things. So I think that's a really important change that we've seen. And certainly in my own work, it is very clear that men can care, that men can, be, you know, do wonderful caring as fathers. It might not overlap exactly with the way that a mother might do mothering, but that's more about how we construct our ideas about what maternal or paternal care should look like. And I think that both men and women are capable of doing what I would call good enough caring. I mean, I think we do sort of overly intensive types of caring anyway. Um, so I th so my research absolutely points to that. And I mean, you'll have to stop me, Sam, at some point, but if I'm going on too long, but um, the, I mean, another really important point is this, is, is this ways in which the language that men can use as well has shifted. Not enough, but the idea of being there, of wanting, of expressing um, a caring um, responsibility, perhaps to an employer, is more acceptable it's not it's not most you know it's not widely enough accepted on the other side of all of this is that again in my research fathers find out that being at home with a small baby is not only hard work it's invisible and it doesn't get you a career progression it doesn't count and that in many ways is such a sort of um statement about the society in which we live where child rearing is invisible, is undervalued, and that is part of the history of it being associated with women's lives. So, and, and then because of the gender pay gap, men do, not in all cases, we have a lot of, of women who are, um, you know, the, the larger earner in households, in couples with households, but it can make decisions about who's going to take leave, who's going to return to work. You need money when you have a baby. Costs don't go down, they go up. And so economic decision making in quite a rational way comes into play. And that can then immediately start to put in place this division, if you like, between, um, you know, you start, you have these wonderful intentions of sharing everything before the birth of a first child. And the practice of actually doing that once the baby is born can be really hard. And it's the worst time to be trying to fight gender equality on gender equality issues with employers or basically trying to dismantle patriarchy in any sort of way when you are a new parent for the first time mm -hmm. you, you're exhausted it is not okay. the right sort of context in which to do that and that's probably enough for me yeah <laughs> thanks so much <laughs> tina yeah really really fantastic um introduction to the the topic and yeah what you what you said and what i remember from reading your your book actually about this desire 
uh, expressed from fathers that, yeah, to be there um, was certainly something which resonated um, for me in terms of the father circles I've been hosting, just that kind of just really basic desire to be there, be present um, for their children's lives. Um, so yeah, moving on to um, our next um, participant. Um, so yeah, Owen Thomas from Future Men. Um, so Owen Thomas is head of programs um, at Future Men, where he leads on the, their, their work on fatherhood. He's got over 15 years experience of working really closely with fathers and male carers at crucial stages of their lives and also advocates for the needs of fathers at local and local and national forums, including at the all par party parliamentary group on fatherhood. Um, so yeah, maybe reflecting on some of your experience, both kind of you know, directly on the coalface with, with, with dads and also kind of you know, working at that kind of higher level with policy. Um, what would you say are, are the, the main social and structural barriers to this more kind of engaged fatherhood? Yeah, thanks, Sam. And thanks for inviting me and organising today's event. Um, Tina's done an amazing job kind of setting us all up and kind of touched on many of the points that we'll probably all expand on to a certain degree uh, to explain. But, to, you know, to speak a little bit about uh, social and structural barriers to, to, to dads getting as engaged as they would want to be or to, to, to breaking down some of the existing uh, gender roles within society, which manifest as a patriarchy, as you said. Um, I mean, I think it's really complicated. You know, fatherhood has really shifted. I think society, fatherhood is one of the roles that men play in their lives, arguably the most important, arguably the most rewarding, um, if you're able to play that role. But I think, um, as you say, there are structurally still some systems in place that follow the patriarchy that we, we've created. I mean, we live in a world in the 21st century. We're all uh, fairly, you know, we're here on a Zoom call. We're, we've got access to technology. We, we, we've got a degree of liquidity in our lives to allow us to do this stuff. So therefore, our issues are based upon that premise. However, the world is, you know, a fairly unequal place. So let's talk about it in the context of Britain in, in the modern times. Um, even in Britain, we're seeing at the moment, there is a quite a big tug, you know, where quite a few of us are moving towards great, wanting greater equality across the board, whether that's around parenting roles, um, uh, uh, gender roles, sexual equality, um, uh, sexual preference equality, all of those kind of things are now being recognised and brought more in line, you know, racial equality over the last year as well. And all of those factors play a role in what men's roles are in regard to how they perceive themselves, who they want to be and what they feel are, and what they're conditioned to believe they can do, you know, and it takes a degree of self agency and it takes a degree of confidence and skill to be able to say, I'm going to break away from some of the norms that I've been brought up around uh, and that are still pervade in our media every day, um, depending on what channels you choose to watch or what social media you're taking or what your preferences are. As we know, there are algorithms that direct our, our viewing to us nowadays. So you don't get such a diverse view, world view anymore. You get kind of more of the same sort of thing. So it's, it's an interesting aspect. And some of the structural stuff really, if we start at the beginning is law, you know, still under law in this country, mothers are deemed as the primary carer, regardless of status of marriage or status of relationship, uh, mums are primary carer under the law. Um, so therefore, if anything happens within a relationship for the child, the assumption is unless mum is in some sort of uh, a problematic state or is unable or hasn't got the capabilities to fulfill her role at that time as a mother, she will always be deemed as the, per the person where the child should be. Or unless she decides amicably with the father or anybody else that she no longer wants to play that role, um, she will be supported by all the mechanisms of the state to, to be deemed as that primary carer in all issues of dispute. And, you know, I'm not here to argue the rights and wrongs out there. That makes sense. Primarily mum, you know, I think that is based upon the needs of the child and the fact that the mum is kind of, um, you know, she's housed that child for nine months, raised that child within her own physical form and given birth to that child. And again, there is an assumption as well around the link to, you know, breast is best and breastfeeding that in the initial care, mothers should be kind of um, given that primacy. However, a lot of research has been shown already shows that um, and a young father I worked with said exactly the same thing to me. Why can't we do everything a mum does? The only thing I can't do is breastfeed, is what the young man said to me, basically. I can do everything else. And study shows that babies will bond with whoever is there giving them care at that particular time. You know, and, and, and you know, if we want to go back historically, I wasn't there, but I, you know, 
I'm sure, as the saying, it takes a village to raise a child is actually based in fact that, you know, you raise your child and of course, mum would have the baby on her breast. But depending on what was going on at the time, other people might step in. We used to have even in, in Victorian society, um, milk, milk, milk uh, kind of nurses, maids that would actually breastfeed the children who weren't their own. So, you know, in terms of who can step in and do a good job of parenting, the law says it should be mum first and foremost. Um, and, and then therefore after that, a lot of structures then fall and, and, are, and are based around that, that premise that law says mum is the primary carer. So therefore anything dad wants to do is within kind of the gift of mum. So uh, per, um, parental leave, as Tina talked about there, access to statutory um, kind of time off work is not equal. We, we were struggling with what was two weeks. Now you've got a shared parental leave that you can divvy up amongst yourselves, but still kind of the way it's set up, it makes it an adversarial process. You know, Many of the dads we support say, look, I could ask my partner if she wanted to go back six months earlier to work and say, I want six or months off at home with the baby, but we can't do it at the same time necessarily um, because, because of, as you say, financial constraints. Um, and also who am I, you know, what kind of, what kind of person would I be to say, mum, look, I want to stay home with the baby that you've just given birth to. You get yourself back to work and let me do the free first three months. You know, a lot of guys, however kind of modern they may see themselves to be with their outlook still want to defer in that position and not necessarily have that difficult conversation even if it may be something mum might be open to they would say if she suggests it I'll go for it but I'm not going to suggest it at this time a sensitive time or while she's pregnant so there are a lot of competing kind of things going on of course there are a lot of men who are quite happy with the status quo and are quite happy so these are the internal barriers to the changes we're looking for that some men you know the point is patriarchy is set up by men for men because it, it advantages us you know, and unless you've been brought up with a keen sense of fairness and feel and, and a sense of empathy and see that, you know, that unfairness is, is not only kind of, um, you know, disadvantageous to women, it's also disadvantageous to yourself as a man, because you have a less reward in life. You know, half of us roughly are going to have daughters, you know. So we've got this kind of imperative to try and make the world fairer for our daughters. There, there is a study that says that um, fathers who have daughters automatically because of the empathy and the care that it gives them for something, for a person they're not romantically involved with, a person that they have caregiving responsibilities towards, that little bit of themselves outside of themselves in a female form, kind of helps build that empathy for those who haven't already got it. So I would say over the 15, 20 years I've been doing this, I've seen men, I've seen society become gradually fairer, equality try to expand and parental roles within that are an extension of that. I see men wanting to break the shackles and the norms. The work we do across the organization isn't just around fatherhood, it's around kind of pivotal transitional moments in the lives of boys and men. And I think in those transitional moments, going from primary to secondary school, moving through adolescence, leaving school and moving into the adult world of work and of relationships, there's teachable times. And fatherhood and parenthood is one of those teachable moments when guys who maybe felt shackled you can open up a whole new world of opportunities to them with the right interventions at the right moment and with the right information you know and it has to be pitched to them at a level that actually they can actually engage with and understand there's no good us kind of delivering a highbrow messages about you know uh, uh, gender equality to people who are living in lives where to express a view of equality may be actually dangerous to your social networks and even to your physical self you know there has to be a gradual process of modeling and of hand holding almost certain groups of people along with us the ones who are probably finding it the most hard to transition while the the middle block the majority are already way ahead of politicians and structures anyway you know you saw this the last week or so john lewis uh, extended equal parenting leave to both parents you know they're not waiting on the government to set you know to catch up with their policy they're doing it you know but interestingly that is an organization now led by a black woman so you know issues of equality are at play there and an understanding and an empathy and actually realizing from our own point of view that actually we're going to get more women into the workplace if we allow men more space and give them more responsibility and caregiving you know so it will happen I just don't think it's a quick fix I think sections of society will, will get there much faster than other sections of society. Um, but it's a journey that, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm confident that as, as everyone has said here, that it's gonna happen. It's really rewarding to see young men, particularly, we work particularly around the young fatherhood as well as um, expectant fatherhood, 
kind of using this moment to really reflect on what they want to do and actually start to think about where they want to be in two years, three years, five years and 10 years from now. And what kind of world, what kind of community they want their children to be born into and brought up in. You know, it, don't, don't get me wrong, you know, we're not changing gang members into, you know, uh, 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 you know, totally perfect 2.4 model dad straight away but a conversation is started and a process has begun you know um and, and a lot of guys really jump up and meet that um that challenge with gusto um okay. great thanks so much thanks no so problem much, no problem yeah wow it is a big question so much to think about uh, so i guess we've um i guess so what have we established here then we've established with tina that um there is there is this trajectory towards more engaged fatherhood. Obviously, it's really wrapped up with um, with uh, women and motherhood as well in very complicated ways. But this trajectory is happening, and then we've established that you know there are still many kind of barriers in place, but that but those are also um, changing. So yeah, introducing my next um, our next uh, uh, participant, um, Jeremy Gilbert. So Jeremy Gilbert is a, a writer and cultural theory academic at the University of East London. Um, his most recent book is uh, 21st Century Socialism, which I also highly recommend if you'd like a kind of very succinct and convincing argument for why socialism is basically the answer to most of the political questions we're facing. Um, uh, he's a bit of a wild card on this, on this panel as his work doesn't really specifically address fatherhood. However, he is A, a father, uh, and B, extremely well versed on feminist history and, and discourse. Uh, and C is also just one of those people with interesting things to say on most topics. Um, so Jeremy, I guess like going back to this kind of question, yeah, patriarchy and fatherhood, there's obviously the, you know, the meaning of, of patriarchy, rule, rule of fathers, but what is that, that link? Uh, what is that relationship between fatherhood and, and patriarchy? Um, and what impact is this greater paternal engagement going to have on both the kind of micro level of relationships between men and women, as well as the macro level of, of culture and, and gender equality? Okay, sure. Hi. Um, thanks for asking me. So, <laughs> okay. Well, I suppose, um, I think, um, I, th I think I'll say something about uh, the last time I was, I mean, the, or, well, the first time, really, I sort of tried to think about all these issues really systematically. So I was um, in the late 90s, I was um, partly as part of PhD research and partly to, for a course, to prepare a course I was teaching on, on, on gender and ideas about the family, actually. So what was then contemporary culture? I went in, um, I, you couldn't, um, this was before... This was the late 90s, so the internet was a thing, but you couldn't just, you know, you couldn't find nearly as much on information online then as you could. So uh, you still had to go up to the the top north end of the Piccadilly line to the Collindale newspaper library if you wanted to um, search newspaper archives. Uh, so I was so I spent about three weeks in Collindale looking for um, anything I could find on very using various keywords and especially I was looking at the phrase crisis of masculinity there'd been a huge amount of discourse on the supposed crisis of masculinity and there was a uh, hundreds and hundreds there were thousands of entries on this phrase crisis of masculinity from especially from the sort of mid 80s through to the late late 90s and the general sense of a sort of crisis which was really, I mean, essentially the sense of a crisis was always linked, obviously, to a set of social, cultural, political changes, which were changing the way in which people you know, experienced gender. And it was linked also to the sense that there was a fairly clear sense of what uh, women's liberation and then broader, you know, a bro more broadly sort of liberal, liberal feminism, as it became increasingly normative across social institutions, had uh, you know uh, was proposing in terms of what women should have access to but there was a great deal of uncertainty in terms of what that would mean for men and what that should mean especially for straight men and especially for men in um who might have otherwise expected to occupy pretty traditional roles and in fact the sort of the conclusion i came to in my own research when i was trying to link that set of issues with things going on at the time in sort of sort of popular culture was that there wasn't it would be more it, it was more accurate to say that what was taking place at that time was a sort of crisis of paternity 
rather than just a crisis of, of masculinity because there was a specific set of anxieties I think around well, what it meant to be an adult man in particular and what it meant to be an adult man if it didn't mean being the breadwinner of a family if that wasn't what what if that wasn't how you defined adulthood for men because adulthood for women was being redefined across quite widely accepted lines adulthood for women was now going to mean you'd, you'd, you'd go as far as you can in, in education you'd have a job you'd have a career you'd become a, a full-scale labor market participant um ideally according to a model a template which had been established by the professional classes really in the early 20th century uh, and whereas for men it wasn't clear like what that meant like if, if it meant anything given that that had, that had been a sort of male preserve and all of those changes were sort of and i think i would say really up until into the first decade of the 21st century broadly speaking you know there was it was pretty easy to observe a, a set of you know a set of changes going on in the culture or a set of processes going on in the culture which were largely a, along those lines i mean really the the big reaction to this the big expression of this was the rise of so-called lad culture and a kind of you know, and a sort of pathologization of, of, sort of infantile sort of male behavior, or a sort of normalization, actually, of what might be seen as fairly pathological forms of behavior for young men in particular. And also a kind of, which was also tied up with, with, it, with questions for, of generational sort of expectations for men and women as well. There was this sort of moving threshold of adulthood whereby, you know, what had been regarded as the ordinary conditions for adult life, you know, access to the property market, access to full-time work, etc., were becoming increasingly, you know, difficult for people to obtain. So all of this was shifting, all of this was in flux. I think, I think there was a fairly significant shift after about two, really after 2008, you know, partly because, because of the general kind of um, disruption to the labour market and the fact that that was really experienced by people, you know, across all different sort of genders. But I think I'm not going to try and give a kind of systematic, a more systematic account because I think, you know, Tina and Owen have both done that really successfully, I think. I think, but what, what, what looking at all those processes really has always brought home to me is the extent to which, well, there is, you know, there is always this question around what the relationship of, you know, what, it, what, what, the play, what we expect or what we want the place of men to be in a post-patriarchal society or in a non-patriarchal society um i think the question i mean one of the questions you asked us to talk think about and, and 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 it was in an article that you circulated sam was this around the question of the extent to which you know engaged fatherhood or expressive fatherhood can be understood as, as making a real kind of challenge to patriarchal norms and, and i think it clearly does to the extent that patriarchy in in when we talk about i, should, I suppose i should say i should it's worth qualifying i think i mean tina already did this really but you know, we, we have a very kind of, we, we tend to find, and I tend to still find today with students, people have a sort of sense that there was this fixed set of gender norms and they started to get destabilised the, by the sexual revolution in the 60s and then by the progress of feminism in the 70s and 80s and then into the 90s. And then before that, there was this kind of, there's this very vague and indeterminate period during which there was a set of very well-established norms. And it's always worth understanding that, well, really that kind of norm of the highly segregated household like it wasn't really it was only ever really a norm for most people for most people in a country like britain for a few decades in the 20th century because before that women had to go out most women did actually have to work uh, on the other hand as far as we can see it was a sort of aspiration for most people for quite a long time before that because it had been established as a norm by the middle classes you know of this highly segregated division of labor with the woman being in charge of managing the household and then and amongst the sort of the upper echelons of the working class it was really it was like the mark of, of success and respectability that a man was able to earn enough that his wife didn't have to go out to work and again that was largely driven by economic efficiency like it wasn't it just it was economically more efficient for you know, for for a man to earn a single wage and for the woman to take responsibility for all of who would have lower, you know, less earning power in the labour market to have access to take on all the caring responsibilities. But so, the, but so there was quite a long period of going back really to the early industrial revolution when it was either normal or it was a, a normal aspiration to have this very strict division of labour. But I think, um, you know, and obviously that this reproduces a set of you know of, of very old uh, ideas around kind of male authority that 
patriarchy means, as you say, the rule of men. It means the rule of fathers, and it actually means the rule of fathers over everybody. So what it implies is a kind of dominant position in society and a kind of position of authority for men who are regarded as having achieved adulthood, like whatever that means. So it means authority for those men, not just over women, but also over younger men, basically, or men who have a less, have a more kind of junior and subordinate position. And... Um, and broadly speaking, I would say that, you know, it, it is a cliche, but it's true that the sort of that, that position of authority is within highly segregated within societies that have have accepted or have valorized highly segregated gender roles. That position of authority is offered a sort of compensation for you know, a, a taking on a role which has a, a fairly significant set of costs as well. It has a really significant set of emotional costs which we've talked about, in, you know, and I think the anthropological evidence is pretty strong that those are emotional costs which men don't take on kind of spontaneously, like willingly outside of social structures where they're being pressured to do so. Social costs that are, and, um, that are to do partly with the kind of emotional, you know, just a lack of emotional engagement with the family, the, the, a, a lack of kind of emotional autonomy, and also, um, you know, and also are to do with actually having, you know, being put under considerable pressure to be the kind of the the responsible uh, take on certain kinds of responsibility which, which can be very stressful and not have a lot of compensation so i think in those ways it is really important and kind of owen alluded to this it's really important to understand that well so sort of dismantling patriarchy is not is not just a kind of reduction of men's power and, and autonomy that in some ways is you know it comes with all these benefits it comes with all these things which are really desirable on the other hand, and this is something that both sort of Tina and Owen have already alluded to, and it is really important to keep in mind that the highly uneven way in which those processes and the ones I described earlier have been unfolding over the past few decades in an increasingly unequal society means that essentially, I mean, there is a certain, there is, we're now living in a society, we're now living in a culture which there is a sort of normalised ideal of co-parenting, of expressive fatherhood. And it's absolutely true that men who want to, in, to experience those things don't suffer the kind of stigma or the kind of, um, you know, uh, it, in the same way that they might have done at earlier times. But it's clearly also the case that really the opportunity to do that is a luxury which is largely confined to, to the professional classes, actually. It's largely within the professional classes that you actually get to do that. And otherwise, you know, it's much more difficult for all of the reasons that people talk about. And I think it's really important. It's important that we kind of recognise the extent to which, you know, the opportunity to do that and, you know, the opportunity to, to dismantle patriarchy it isn't kind of evenly distributed across society. And it's also not really... Um, and, but I think at the same time, and I, I do think this is something we have to be wary of, I think we have to be quite we have to be careful about not making that sort of the right to have a kind of egalitarian and expressive and emotionally fulfilling experience of fatherhood just yet another right that people that men can claim uh, as a kind of marker of their success in the meritocratic hierarchy of the you know the labor market because uh, i think we're in danger of that really we're in danger of heading towards a situation in which basically that's going to that in effect we're going to normalize a situation where if you get if you go to the right school you go to the right university you get to the right job then part of part of your reward for that will be a life in which you get to be a sort of you know post a, a sort of post-feminist post-patriarchal father uh, but you only get that as a reward for having for success in the labor market basically in the same way we're effectively being encouraged to you know accept everything is just a, a reward for success in the labor market so i think it's very important that we really don't um it's really important that we don't allow that to happen and mm. i think and that we don't we don't allow uh, because really, and I think there is a real danger of it happening for, for the reasons which, are, I mean, really Owen has set out already. Mm. Okay, thanks so much, Jeremy, um, for that kind of, yeah, eagle's eye view of, uh, of patriarchy uh, and, yeah, and the history of paternal engagement and, and, and what that's looking like and the risks in terms of the current trajectory. Um, so, yeah, I'd like to bring it back now kind of really in a kind of really concrete way to um the experience of of you know a variety of different fathers um and i'd like to introduce um ian blackwell so ian is founder of uh dangerous dads which uh as i understand start, started out as a, a single father's group um like fathers out, out in nature um down in devon but he now 
Uh, he now supports a, a network of fathers groups across the UK. And he's also a lecturer at Plymouth uh, Marjan University and a PhD researcher into fathers groups. Hmm. So, so yeah, Ian, um, I mean, in terms of your experience working with a, you know, quite a wide variety of fathers, and so, yeah, not only the kind of, I guess, ones of the professional class that Jeremy just alluded to, um, working with them directly, how do you think men are, are relating to fatherhood um, differently in the context of this kind of more mainstream feminist discourse and, yeah, changing expectations around paternal engagement? Yeah, thanks. Um, I think if you spoke to the fathers I work with, um, the terminology wouldn't be something they're familiar with. They wouldn't understand a, a feminist discourse, for example. Um, and my work with them has shown that they have, um, it's what I call dadness. So it's a kind of a sense of who they are as a dad. It's quite individual. Um, they're self-reflective as a father. They're often comparing the way they father with um, their own fathers or their absent fathers or with other fathers they come across. Um, they're very caring. They're, I think they're very in tune with sort of co-parenting in an egalitarian way if they're with the, the child's mother still. So I think this sort of this dadness quality is quite a nice term um, that I was made aware of through my studies with fathers. Um, and I think that sort of encapsulates a little bit the sort of contemporary notions of progressive, hands-on, active fatherhood. That, and although everyone does it differently, I think there are certain elements to that, that a father's identity, if you like, in the current climate that is seen across the socioeconomics and the demographics and the age groups that we come across. I think all the fathers that we see are trying to be the best dads in the world and they struggle and for some it's easy because they have like Jeremy said they have the resource they have um, time off work they have the stand-up paddle boards and the you know all the equipment to, to be those active dads and others uh, really struggle but I think they're all trying to be good dads what they're also trying to maintain though is that sense of a difference from mothering and that comes across as a few of the dads I've spoken to would disregard that. They'd say, I'm no different at all. I, I don't see any gender distinctions in my parenting from that of a mother. And I don't care what other people think. I, I just don't really um, pay attention to gender anymore. But that's a minority. And I think what they're tr a lot of them want to retain a sense that fathering is different to mothering. They can be very caring and they can take on what you'd, I suppose traditionally you'd say would mothering roles uh, but they want it to be seen they want to describe themselves as fathers um, and, and I think we're really what we're talking about is a transition period we're, we're moving from what was seen as a fairly there was a typical picture of what a father in the west did and looked like in the 50s and 60s and over the decades that shifted and at some point in the future, maybe 20 or 30 years away, we may have a very different picture about parenting that is much more degendered. So I think we're in that transition period. We're somewhere in the middle for a lot of fathers. They've taken on a lot of those you know, feminine uh, roles and, and, and care work quite happily, but they're not yet saying, I'm, I'm a parent. They, they, they want to retain that fatherliness, if you like. So I suppose the question we have, though, is um, why is patriarchy still with us? Because it is all pervasive and it has been for centuries. You know, we, it's there, isn't it? Everywhere we look, there's patriarchy. It's in economics, it's in culture, it's in religion, it's in sport, it's certainly in politics. And a lot of, you know, so I think the question, so I've looked at the micro level, but it then sort of brings us to the macro level. What, what is it? Why? haven't we seen those significant shifts if you like it's a gradual process but we'd like to see more change i think at that mac macro level that global level you know, donald trump's a father <laughs> but doesn't seem to have impacted boris has several children and you know it's sort of their their dads but it have why has why did they particularly trump you know um, and his supporters bolster and maintain patriarchy 
because it benefits them. So you know, just by de facto being a father it doesn't mean that you interested in undermining patriarchy and for many people that's quite the opposite and we've been very focused on the UK and, and Western European nations you know and obviously fatherhood and masculinity and patriarchy plays out very differently in local contexts around the globe um, so I think what I'm interested in my research is that is a link between the two I suppose which is around community because my work is with dads groups in community settings and what's great for me is I've observed for many years fathers together as dads from different backgrounds being dads together. And they may not talk a lot, but you know that, that the, the, pa the power of those settings where they're together and they can, where, where do we see that in society where a bunch of dads can get together and just hang out and play with their kids and see other parenting styles and see, you know, dad singing or changing a nappy or, you know, or, or being, um, quite harsh with the child for example and so what I think the community settings do with dads together they do that solo it gives dads a chance to solo parent which is really important as Tina says but it also gives them a chance to just clock other types of, of dadness and 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 go all oh, right you know that oh, I wouldn't do it that way or yeah actually you know I can see that's you know he's doing a good job and and they do have those little gestures that between men that say a lot you know, there's little nods and all right, mate, and phew, you know, you did, did all right. And there's just those little remarks, I think, that are really mean, meaningful in in interaction. And I, I think that's where we could look to see change happening. It's amongst communities of men that are supported by their children, their, the staff, the communities around, like the village around our dads and obviously by their partner and whatever relationship that might be so I think that's I think a nice way to bridge if you like the the micro and those macro structural issues around gender and patriarchy is how do we work collectively if you like to support dads to be confident raise their self-esteem you know be the dads they want to be and feel confident that they will go out into the world and not just deal with patriarchal issues within the family or within the, their own identity but then they go to work and they spot you know uh, things that aren't right and spot privilege and and uh, patriarchal comments or structures and think okay you know I'm gonna I'm gonna tackle that work I'm gonna tackle that in my leisure time I'm gonna tackle that in the that my the local politician or you know I'm going to tackle that in the media you know that's I think we want to energize men as dads to feel comfortable in their families but then I think go out beyond that and and we it's a collective job isn't it for all of us um yeah I'll mm. stop there lovely thanks so much Ian um yeah what an amazing uh collection of contributors thanks so much to everyone um so i mean there's so many possible threads we could we could uh, pursue there um but yeah i'd like to bring uh tina back in i mean i wonder actually um if you could say a little bit uh particularly in reference to what ian was just saying about uh kind of you know obviously we've been thinking about the kind of uk context um but you're i'm really interested to hear a bit more about your work with uh refugee fathers and the kind of different ways that they express their care for, for, for their children. Yeah, uh, yeah, no, I'd really like to do that. And, um, but just quickly before that, I mean, we're talking about, you know, one of the things about patriarchy is patriarchy is basically about power and that, and men have had the power to choose, not all men at all. And we know that there's, you know, that this is a sort of very oversimplified way of thinking about it, but, in terms of children someone's got to care for children you know we have children actually we need population regeneration perhaps not on the scale that we've had in the past but you know we actually do need people to have children and so i just want to sort of just put out there as well that patriarchy of course we know is all about power but it's who has got the choice and the choices have still predominantly in most areas remained with um, being, you know, in the domain of, of men. I mean, if we just look at who is leading the country currently, denies his, 
you know, his fatherhood. I mean, is I mean, as a very, very poor role model of um, fatherhood, and just absolutely demonstrates a choice of optional parenting or optional fatherhood or all of those things. And it's not that I want him to be going on about it the whole time, but you know, I think so. At the root of all of this is someone is always having to carry the responsibility, and I would argue that men in particular historical moments, and, and absolutely that's, you know, you know um, the idea that women are now just in the workplace, of course, is a fallacy. Uh, you know, women, some women have always had to work. Some poor women, um, you know, have always had to do work, but we haven't acknowledged it because it wasn't what we, you know, it, it, I mean, there's so many aspects of women's lives have been invisible. So I'm just, um, I'm not going on a rant here at all, but I'm just sort of putting in there who has choices and who hasn't had them historically. That works against men too. The men who want to be more involved find that they don't have the choices in relation to how they'd like to be involved. Anyway, just want to put that out there, but also then to talk about this incredible and wonderful project I'm involved in, funded by the British Academy. It's a very small study, but I've actually lived and worked in various places in the world many years ago and more in Bangladesh and Solomon Islands, I've seen how villages raise children. Um, I've seen, you know, extreme poverty and the, the, the absolute fundamental desire to protect your child when it's born, may, whether you're a, a man or a woman. Um, but this study that we're doing currently, I'd been in Syria a year before the war broke out. I got so fed up when I was back here a year on the war breaks out. And then the media's depiction of male refugees in particularly in, in the jungle in Calais. And I thought if, you know, really depicted as, you know, barbarians trying to get in here to, to the UK to rape and pillage. And, um, you know, it was just so well just, just dreadful and um so anyway we we started to we've, we've basically doing a study where we're where we're following men so lots of women refugees quite rightly are seen as vulnerable and and their children but men are rarely seen as vulnerable and so we wanted to reframe that we wanted to think about what do we do if we look if we follow men's journeys so we we're just following a small number of families uh, but through the the father, it's the father we have contact with. We're working with a Syrian um, refugee as our research assistant, and we yeah we're doing the most brilliant um, study I think in following these men. And actually, what we're seeing is lots and lots of vulnerabilities. The incredible desire to protect, and I think that a, a key factor we miss about what caring is because we're always just thinking about maternal caring is that mums and dads want to protect it's the ultimate thing when you become a parent it's not only that teachable moment which I absolutely recognize Owen um, for any parent any mother or father but it is all about protection there is something about you want to protect and so with you see the ultimate protection if you are prepared to put your child in a boat and come across you know a, a, to try and get to safety so really just um, to say that what, but what, what, what we are also seeing is that the men's cultural, and, and Ian was talking uh, a bit about sort of cult, you know, culturally constructed practices of um, what fathering should be like or what mothering should be like, for example. Uh, and the Syrian fathers want to not only protect, provide safety and protect their children by getting them to a safe country, but the idea of being a breadwinner is very much part culturally of how they, expect to do fathering. In fact, what we see them doing is lots of what we might read in through another lens as involved fathering. You know, they're taking their kids to school, they're dealing with the school, they're doing this, they're doing that, they're taking the kids to doctor's appointments. They're, much, they're very involved, but actually they want to be providing economically for them. I mean, it throws up all sorts of questions, relates to what Jeremy was saying about the role for themselves. So um, we haven't completed the study yet, but we're really hoping uh, to take it to all party parliamentary group fatherhood. David Lamy knows it would be supportive of the study, but um, it's a, a wonderful piece of work, but it really provides a lens um, into masculine identities, but into the very, very basic essentials of caring for our children, almost irrespective of who's doing it, except it is clearly the men who are doing it. So yeah, it's, it's a really, it's, it's been, um, you know, a very humbling study to be part of. 
Cool. You want Sorry, me to... yeah, yeah. Thanks so much, Tina. Um, so yeah, Owen. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, so Tina was talking there about some of the kind of stereotypes around um, refugee men, and I, yeah, mm. I was watching watching the, the the video replay of uh, you in the all all party parliamentary group the other day, and there was there was a uh, there was a particular question from um, I, I I assume. The, the, uh, conservative MP, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean, right? Uh, yeah. it was, and it was basically just like, oh, how, what can we do about these terrible fathers who just don't want to take responsibility yeah. for, their, for their kids? And I really enjoyed your response. So I wondered if you could say a bit more about that, the kind of like stereotypes around, around absent fathers. I, I, I think it ties back again to this kind of idea that, you know, Tina and Jeremy were talking about, you know, about our unequal society and that, you know, He's a man from a very privileged background to a certain extent, but there is a duality to his existence because he's a father and cares about fatherhood enough to want to be part of the all party parliamentary group on fatherhood. But it's fatherhood through his lens from his experience, you know, uh, a, a bit like, um, you know, a bit like Boris, a bit like the other one with whose child's called Sixtus, I can't re -smog. you know, he's got loads of kids. But he's got he sees father from a very particular point of view. So when they make generalizations, you know, and I guess to a degree, when I heard a bit more what I was saying was that you know he and his wife run a surgery and they have young single mums turn up at their surgery who are struggling, who are financially in problems. And when they are asked, so but where's the father to help you with all of this stuff? Because that's kind of like their worldview that the state shouldn't step in, it should be something that's taken care of by the people who should be responsible for this talks to Tina's point about men wanting to be breadwinners. The mum would say, well, he's not around or I'm not with him. Now, at that point, his interest in why that would be wanes. And he just says, well, here's someone who's not taking financial responsibility for the life he's brought into this world. So therefore, he'd become less than nothing to me. As you said, he's become a terrible, irresponsible person. He's not interested in the background story as to why the father and the mother may have split up or why the mother didn't want the father in their life. There might be a terrible story behind it. It might be a horrible man. Absolutely, I don't know, but that, that assumption again falls within this assumption again that children should be with their mothers. No, you know, there are a myriad of factors right here in the UK, um, a lot of stereotypes about what men are and when they should be useful. You know, I, the work I do, a lot of the fathers I work with are seen as risks to be managed rather than assets to be invested in, you know, and I think there's a really short term view of how we look at fatherhood and rather than see all the benefits of a more egalitarian society that we would get if fathers kind of were supported, those who needed to be supported rather than those who are choosing to do it. As, as Jeremy pointed out, there is a whole strata of society of men who are leading, who say, no, this is how I want to live my life. I find this rewarded. I'm more emotionally in touch with who I am and with the people around me. And this is something I want. This is a benefit. I see what's in this for me. For other guys that we work with, it's a much harder journey for them to get to a point where they can see actually, there is a benefit for me. Actually, I might have to make changes. Actually, sacrifices they are to me, give up some of my limited power um, as I see it um, and my, some of my limited freedoms, you know, within our society, they are limited and actually realise that there are other benefits. It's a bit like what we, what we say in modelling behaviour to children, it's deferred gratification. You know, you have to put aside your immediate needs sometimes and look for what's going to come in the future because a lot of guys don't have that pull of that urge Sometimes if they're not attached when the baby's um, in utero, if they're not with the mum at that time, if they don't build a relationship with baby bump for want of a better word, or don't have a positive sense of what kind of dad they want to be, they can be disconnected. They can struggle with attachment and bonding with their new child. Um, and they can think, well, there's something I'll defer to later on. You know, I'll get more involved when they're a bit older. And, and, and we spend a lot of our time saying, no, that's a really missed opportunity. You know, we try and help dads who are fitting into other people's stereotypes and ideas of what they are, break that, you know, to realize that, you know, you don't want to live up or down for, for want of a better word to that expectation. You actually can do more and you should do more. And actually I recognize you are disadvantaged in this situation. As much as I might not agree with all the decisions you made to this point, actually, I know, I know how hard it is for you to actually, you know, f feel attached to your child when you're not allowed to see your child when, you know, unless you come up with a certain amount of money every week, you know, you know, you're not going to be allowed anywhere near them because of mistakes you may have made in your relationship before this point to now. And this is not to excuse any form of domestic violence. We work with guys around domestic violence as well. And there are very clear um, kind of um, uh, milestones they have to achieve to prove and to be able to have decent relationships with their children that are equitable and are not based upon a power dynamic that is unfair within a relationship. Um, 
But because of that, you know, they're not reached reached a criminal threshold, but they're very easy. Rather than talk to this guy and address all of his structural external issues, let's just leave him to one side and deal with mum. A lot of this back is back down to what I was saying at the beginning, law. It's about resource. The government doesn't want to support two parents. You just just support one with the baby. And if the other one's any good, they'll come along and get involved, sort of thing. You know, we'll find them the, the only agency that actually has a remit to kind of engage fathers is the child maintenance enforcement commission the only agency that collects data on fathers statutorily is the prison service unfortunately because they statutorily ask men about their status as fathers when they're incarcerated nobody else does it no other department in government actually statutorily collects systematically data on fathers even we got to the point where we were talking about the joint registration of children nearly got there under Tony Blair and Labour a few years ago, but because of concerns from women's group about, you know, there are a dangerous minority of men who may use that joint birth registration as a way to influence, exert power or control or even try and harm their ex-partners if they're no longer with them. Um, that was shelved, you know, rather than actually look at ways to actually protect women in that situation, but make the majority of people more responsible, we actually said, no, no, we'll leave that. So things like the APPG, which, by the way, um, David Lamy has stepped down from. It's now Andrew Gwynn MP, but he's a really good guy who's actually got um, uh, 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 he's actually got um, responsibilities for one of his grandchildren. One of his sons struggled, so he took up a, a, a caring role for his grandson and wrote an article this weekend in the Independent about his new role as the chair of the APPG and how important fatherhood is to him. Even though he thought he was finished with it 20 years ago, <laughs> you know, he's now kind of re-stepped into that role as a male carer with his wife for his grandchild. So I think, you know, he's really interested in. You know, looking at wins for the men as a whole across the board, whilst also having a focus on those who are marginalised and less less enfranchised, people who are not seeing their kids regularly, dads who are from poor socioeconomic backgrounds or from uh, minority ethnic groups who are struggling with society's wider views on who they are and where fatherhood fits into that. You know, so so you know, there, there's so many layers to this, uh, and I think I'm really caught up in this idea when I do this work as a someone from a gendered organization I find myself a lot of the time having to repeat the same kind of trope at the beginning to kind of reassure people that I'm not a fathers for justice type campaign who's going to throw dry paint at you and, and is you know a, a, a hater of women I actually am a person who you know have by having read a little bit believes I am feminist in my outlook on the world I believe in equality for all and I do believe that men should have no more power in any certain situation than women and I think but in the one area of life where women uh, kind of have been given by men a responsibility in the realm of caring we if we sort that out a bit everything else will kind of follow because men will realize I haven't got time to try and dominate people because as Tina pointed out parenting is actually quite hard it takes up quite a lot of your time you know and it does teach you a lot of lessons about life and about fairness you know and if you genuinely do love and care for your daughters and you don't want them to be suffer from some of the kind of heinous crimes that are committed against women still in our 21st century society um the idea that I, you can you as a dad can follow your daughters around for the rest of their lives protecting them from all these horrible men becomes a no-brainer i can't do that what i need to fight for is a fairer society you know not that i hope that i'm bigger and stronger than all of the men she might bump into that just will not work you know so i think in in, in the short term <laughs> those are the short wins in the long term we do have to engage governments and we do have to engage those with privilege to get them to see the challenges for people who aren't as privileged and as lucky as them and make structures fairer for all. Um, yeah, and I've got a fairly hard stop because I've got to do what I can see Jeremy doing there, which is some marvellous <laughs> par marvelous parenting. <laughs> Lovely. Thanks so much, Owen. Yeah, Owen's got to head off now, um, sadly. So he won't be here for the Q&A, but thanks so much. Um, and his details are in the chat box if you do have any um yeah, them, if you'd like to please do get in touch and if you're interested in that APPG if you go to our website you can register there for the mailing list and you'll get sent an invite to all the meetings as they come up and you can just observe or you can join the debate um, and contribute please do I think I think the, the, the parliamentarians need to hear from real people so please mm. do participate. Fantastic thanks so much Owen. Take really care all. Your Enjoy the rest of the session. Take care. Um, okay so yeah at some point I'd like to speak a bit about um Father Figures, the project I mentioned at the beginning, um, and then we're going to go to uh, a Q&A. Um, before we do that, um, Jeremy or Ian, have you got anything you'd like to respond to in terms of the, the kind of the no, debate? Let's, let's, let's go over. That's fine. Yeah. Okay, Ian? Anything particular you'd like to say before the Q&A? No, no, I think 
Okay. Let other people ask questions. Yeah, there's cool. one in the chat I noticed. Great. Yeah. So we'll go to the um, we'll go to the questions and we'll basically do a kind of you know old fashioned like hands up style Q and A. Uh, before we do that, um, I'm I just like to I think hear an echo. Can you, is that an echo from Jules's room or something? Sorry, I can hear an echo of my voice somewhere in the room. Um, I'd like to just say a little bit about yeah the the project that um, I, I've been working on since September and we'll be launching um, in the autumn. So the project is called Father Figures. Um, and let me just find my notes. Yeah, so basically uh, I'm looking for, uh, hopefully a, a diverse cohort of um, 12 people, including me, so 11 other people, to take part in a, uh, a six month collaborative learning journey on, on fatherhood, on modern fatherhood. Um, and yeah, I'll be exploring some of the questions we've been um, discussing this evening. Um, yeah, and just focusing on how we can create a really positive collective vision of, of, uh, of engaged, active fatherhood more broadly. Um, so it's based on a really innovative um, collaborative learning model called the Learning Marathon, developed by a social enterprise called Enroll Yourself. Um, and I'd just like to invite Zara, if, she, if she's there. Just I to am say, here who is the founder of Enroll Yourself, just say a little bit about um, Enroll Yourself and the learning, learning Marathon model. Sure, yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Zara. Um, this is such an interesting discussion. I've been um, feeling many thoughts um, provoked by this and I've been writing things down. Um, so yeah, just really briefly, a little bit about Enroll Yourself. Um, so what it's all about is spreading the power of peer groups um, and peer groups are essentially small groups um, in a very similar vein um, to what Ian um, was describing before, um, non-hierarchical small groups um, where people can learn together or support one another um, and can be used for all kinds of different purposes. Um, but what's important is that they're centered around the resources and the wisdom of the people within the group rather than people outside the group somewhere in the world, the experts that we should be learning from. Um, and I think Owen mentioned earlier this idea of kind of a tug in society towards uh, greater equity on lots of different facets. Um, and I think you can kind of look at peer groups as a response to that same kind of tug, but within the learning um, and support kind of space. So they're a way um, they're a way of doing that and and I suppose you could also look at them um, in some ways as being sort of post patriarchal as well, although that wasn't necessarily the intention when enroll yourself began. Um, and so at enroll yourself we do two things we run our own peer groups of which this um, collective that Sam is is bringing together will will be one. Um, and then we also work with organizations to sort of bring our understanding of, of the way peer groups work um, to their challenges and organizations as well. Um, and the learning marathon structure is essentially a six month obstacle course that a peer group can go through together to help them really maximize the potential of being a collective. Um, because I think it can be a really different experience to um, learn as part of a collective than the traditional types of learning that we're used to, where you, you know, you're often um, absorbing or consuming information. It becomes a, a sort of a more complex exchange um, going in lots of different directions. And so the learning marathon structure is all about um, helping a group um, to actually navigate the, the potential that's there, I would say. Um, and the Learning Marathon really, really started because originally I was looking for a way to continue that really sort of, um, for want of a better word, like sparkly feeling um, that I've had in learning experiences in my own life where you're part of a, a group of people who each bring a different perspective or a different um, magic of their own um, and, and how enlivening that could, that could be. Um, and I wanted to find a way to keep doing that alongside, um, alongside my work and sort of never lose that really. Um, and so the Learning Marathon is all about um, helping people to, to keep that in lots of different ways. Um, and we, we train hosts like Sam, who then um, connect people around something that they, that they really care about. So um, just really exciting that there might be a group 
um, around this theme because what what a great theme to sort of really dig into over over six months. Um, so yeah, that's me. Back to you, Sam. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Zara. Um, so yeah, I've taken this this um, amazing model, and yeah, I mean, I've, I've just seen the kind of I've seen a group that has gone through that that journey together and at their a kind of showcase of their learnings and you can just it's one of those things you know when you walk into a room you can sense that something magic has happened and just from how everyone is and how everyone is together that's kind of why i got inspired to to do this work via, via the learning marathon model although although i've uh, decided to change it change the language around learning marathon to just learning journey because it just sounds a bit too exhausting for for fathers <laughs> <laughs> um that was a bit of feedback i got um so yeah so the idea is um that yeah, everyone in the group will have their own question and focus in relationship to fatherhood, which could be, you know, project based, it could be something quite external and out in the world, or it could be completely personal. Um, so, you know, for example, how, how can first time fathers be better supported into uh, in the transition into father into parenthood? Um, or it could be, you know, how, how can I raise my son to be a feminist? It could be very specific and personal, or it could be a, a more kind of broader question. Um, but then, yeah, we're also going on a kind of very collective journey in which we'll be supporting and, and learning from each other along the way. Um, it's going to be mostly online, although hopefully we'll be able to have some face-to-face -face meetups along the way, and it will culminate in a yeah, public showcase in which we demonstrate those learnings. Um, I anticipate most of these people will be fathers or father figures of some kind, but I'd also love to speak to people with research or professional interests in, um, in fatherhood or creative ones. Um, and yeah, we're really looking looking for it to be a, a very diverse cohort. So uh, if you've got any ideas about how to reach out to people who aren't, you know, the usual suspects for this kind of thing, that'd be really welcome. And there are bursary places for for the program. Um, so yeah, so if that's something that interests you, or you think you might know someone who might be interested, or an organisation that might want to support it, um, you can express uh, interest in on the website in the chat box, um, or you can drop me an email at samweatherald at gmail.com and i'll send that out in, in a, a mail out to all attendees as well um so yeah any any questions on that before we jump into the wider q a any questions on that can't see any no great okay so um who's got some questions for our amazing contributors then in that case you can just you can um you can either use the kind of raise hand function on reactions um, or you can drop a question in the chat box. I think are there already some questions in the chat box, if you say. Um, or if uh, I can see you, I can see you on, on, on the gallery view, then you can just raise your hand. So however you want to express your desire to ask a question, go for it. Or just unmute yourself and go for it. Okay, there's a question in the in the chat box. So a question for the panel. Really, really important question. The discussion tonight has been quite heteronormative. Yeah, yeah, I really take that on board actually. Um, to what extent is our wider acceptance and awareness of LGBTQ plus issues playing into the into dismantling of the patriarchy? Who would like to tackle that one? Jeremy? Um, sure, well, yeah, I, I mean, it obviously is. Like, it does play an important role. And the, um, I would say, for example, it, I mean, it's interesting that uh, in the English-speaking world, and I mean, partly because, you know, the kind of normative ideology in the Anglo-Saxon world really is sort of liberalism, sort of liberal individualism. It's been fairly, compared to a lot of other countries, it's been fairly painless, the extent to which... In particular, like same-sex parenting has been accepted and normalised. So, like in France, for example, it's been much, much more contentious. Like not, not just because of the Catholic Church being opposed, but because of sort of psychology. You know, the big, big school, you know, big sort of block of Freudian psychologists, like really opposed as well, like to um, same-sex parenting. So I think it is, you know, I mean, it's really to be honest, it's. Uh, I mean, I don't want to sound complacent. But I always have to say, like, if you were, if, you know, you know, if you'd have, if you'd asked me or practically any social commentator if it would have been as widely accepted with as relatively little friction as it has been, like in the late 80s, like over the next few decades, we'd have said no, no chance. 
So it, I think it is pretty striking. And I think it's, um, you know, I think it's, it, I think it is, you know, it's always been an important issue and it's always been an important issue. Um, within, I mean, I remember it was, you know, it was a big part, it was a big question within sort of gay radicalism in the 70s and 80s was a questionable as to whether, you know, whether queerness meant a rejection of, of any form of sort of familial life or whether it just meant embracing kind of historically, you know, traditional forms and or whether it meant something else. And I, I suppose what's striking, I suppose what, what I would say what's striking is that broadly speaking, I think what's been accepted is the idea that like queer parenting is fine is more fine the closer it just resembles you know a conventional idea of of the traditional household and I, I think on the one hand I would say the thing compared to what say some of the most interesting you know sort of gay thinkers were, were looking for in the 70s and 80s what we haven't really seen is, is any very significant sort of social or cultural support for really experimenting with different forms of household and different Sort of dimension, you know, multi multi parent households, you know, collective child rearing and this kind of thing. And I think that, I mean, that's something I think we shouldn't be too complacent about personally. And I think in that in that sense, you know, the idea that far, I mean, in the end, like what fatherhood means is you are one of a pair of people raising some children. The idea that hasn't really changed, I think, is it is a bit sad. I mean, I always remember. Um, the great sort of gay, you know, sort of theorist and critic Alan Sinfield, who, who was writing in the 80s, you know, it was a very different historical moment, but he talked about, he was one of the first sort of British critics, sort of gay critics actually, to be really critical of, about the way in which, sort of again, sort of 1990s, at the, at the, mo the great moment of kind of normalisation in, in British, for British attitudes on same-sex relationships is the 90s. Like if you just look at the British, the social attitude surveys at the start of the decade, it's a minority of people who think, <coughs> you know, you know same-sex relationships of any kind are, are, are morally acceptable. And by the end of the decade, um, it's, a, it, you know, it, it, it's, you know, it's, I think it's close to a majority. So there's a big period. Um, but also during that period, like, you know, one thing that gay critics like increasingly noted was that, you know, there's a particular, especially for men in particular, a particular idea of what it meant to be gay was promoted. And it meant to be to have like no kids and lots of money and like, you know, taut muscles and um, live, basically live like a teenager forever. And then there was a, there was a lot of kickback against that. From various and that, that has been sort of displaced but one of the first pe people uh, critics i read really criticizing that was sinfield and sinfield said well you know part you know gay people have got to, gay men have got to think about what it means if we're not going to have children of our own which at that time it was legally wasn't possible still what does it mean to, we're still going to be symbolically fathers you know, we, we're going to be adults we're going to play a nurturing role like towards younger people like we're going to we're going to be involved in raising the next generation uh, and for me, that always that raised a really interesting set of questions about well, what you know, what now I think hetero. This is off the topic of heteronormativity in, in a way because we, we've not. I mean, I think we have quite been quite successful at accepting that having um, being you know not being in a straight couple relationship doesn't mean you won't have children. But there is an interesting set of questions as to how what we think the role played by people who aren't going to have children of their own is in in the kind of social and cultural practices of child rearing and i think it's really important because you know we you know there it is really important to think about that especially because there are you know increasing numbers of childless people you know for whatever reason you know whether it's you know to do with their sexuality or, or otherwise and and i think it is really and i think it is really um you know a kind of ideal aspiration should be to think about well what does parentality if you like what does it mean like for everybody and, and to what extent do we accept well it is a sort of it's a shared responsibility for all of us you know we're all raising all of our children all the time in a sense we are the village you know mm. but, and i think that's a really I, th I think that is a really important question and i think the most and I think that people coming out of, you know, people who, cha the challenge to heteronormativity historically is one of the most fruitful sources for thinking about those issues. That, mm. That's my point, really. Mm. Yeah, I'd, I'd really, I'd really echo that. And I've had quite a lot of conversations with people recently about that it's not only the, a collective responsibility, it's also a collective need that, you know, lots of people like want to have relationships with with young people, with young people, with, with children, babies, and actually see, sometimes see the only way of doing that as having a baby, 
whereas you know it would be you know great to live in a world in which um it was much easier for for adults to have relationships with with children who weren't either their students um or that were related to them and that that's the kind of thing that happens more in 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 communities in in that village that we've been talking about um are there any more questions i mean we could talk we could carry on talking about that for the next 10 10 15 minutes or are there any other questions can't see any anyone got the hand up in that case ian or, or tina would you like to follow up on that oh, oh Sh um sean goodwin you have to unmute yourself yeah. sean yeah, sorry. This is just off the top of my head, but you know, I'm beginning to think about. You know, I worked as a teacher in 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 primary schools, and you know, the role of young male teachers that wanted to work with early years ages. You know, they had a really hard time. Um, you know, I remember that that they they had a really hard time being accepted as carers of younger children, of educators of younger children. Um, so, you know, this links to this conversation of fatherhood. Um, if we can't accept young men that want to work with kids in our society, whether it's in nurseries, nursery provision, which is traditionally a female sphere or primary schools, you know, that's another, another issue. They're not fathers, but they're men who want to work with children, I think it's very important for young young boys to grow up with with male role models around. Whereas, you know, working as a woman in in, in primary years, it, it, it's very female dominated. Or anyway, I'll just flag that up as an issue. So yeah, thanks, John. That's a re really important point, Ian. Um, in terms of your work with with fathers and father figures um how, how often have you, have you kind of encountered men who are who aren't necessarily um you know fathers or better kind of stepfathers or just yeah father figures in 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 kids lives oh yeah plen plenty of times yeah the uh the men that come to our events are i mean you know we don't do a dna dna test so um they're the grandfather mum's partner uh, an uncle you know, a friend that mum trusts, social, you know, whatever, foster fathers, all, all sorts of father figures of different ages and backgrounds, as I say. What's really interesting from my research is how the fathers talk about their children as collectively seeing fathers being capable adult parents and that they can, they can see men can parent effectively so that's one of the advantages i think of these these groups and the mums talk about in particular their daughters seeing men as caring safe um, they see positive fatherhood in action in these groups and we've had settings it's like the old days like in the 70s if you fell over in the street a stranger would pick you up and go you know is this his child is this you know scratched his knee and it's, we, we see that at our events, it's quite interesting, particularly the, so if you have an overnight camp, you know, and the kids are charging around the woods and one of them falls over, another dad will go and, you know, see to the child and help him or her to find her dad, you know. And that's very unusual. I mean, you know, because men in the media and general in society, you know, were seen as um, dangerous individuals on the whole. You know, if you see a stranger in the park, he, as a man, you'd um, be very cautious of that man until you knew otherwise, which is a, sh which is a shame. Um, so I think that, you know, as I say, yes, yeah, so seeing dads as capable, caring, um, safe, you know, adults who, who can care for children is really valuable. And I think it's sending a message to those children that, you know, there's a different way to be a dad. Mm. Mm. Yeah. That's really, really lovely. I think that's, you know, go, I just think it does feed back into the conversation about early years because mm. obviously that's all tied up with how, you know, I have lots of stories of men who want to work in early years, but the, the parents won't allow a man, you know, 23 year old to change a nappy of a mm. one year old. They just won't. 
accept that and that's often why they um, don't last long in early years or, or you know or go into another profession mm. yeah some of that chat around um discussion around uh yeah men who aren't biological or, or even just kind of like primary carers um having relationships with, with kids it kind of reminds me of in in many many cultures is that really lovely um idea of like uncle just calling uncle and auntie you know just calling all adults basically un uncle or auntie and just re relating to them in that kind of familiar way which which we, we don't seem to have in this culture and I, re I really enjoy that in other cultures um tom jeffrey you've got, got your hand raised i think that'll be the last question um hi it's actually my name's emily um okay hi emily hi we're just um listening to this and um i I currently have a, a baby attached to my breast, which is why the camera's off. And it just it got me thinking about the fact that you've talked about the gender pay gap and how that interferes with a couple's intention to have um, more equal uh, roles in like parenting a baby. Um, but the breast feeding issue seems to me to be also a massive like uh, the, uh, we're facing that as well like if you do want to breastfeed there is a like how would how do you um then if you have any ideas about how you might see society changing so that um a woman could breastfeed but there would still be this you know opportunity to parent more equally Thank you, Emily. Um, Tina, do you want to do you want to take that one? Uh, hi, Emily, um, and everyone, of course. Again, um, I mean, I think, of course, breastfeeding is um, a really important issue. Women are encouraged to breastfeed. It's incredible the number of women who actually have problems breastfeeding. Uh, we don't have the, you know, certainly breastfeeding is not a hundred percent. Um, it's not what everyone either can do or chooses to do, even though with support, most can get there in the end. So it is really important. But it's also often held up as, you know, the sort of the, the, the barrier that is so hard to overcome and the thing that really um, can make trying to make trying to achieve some sort of equality. Um, you know, it's it's presented as the yeah, as the, as the stumbling block, if you like. And. I mean, I just feel that we can put people on the moon. We should be able to organize a society, whether that is that women um, want to, to work, want to return to work, want to be able to breastfeed at work. Um, you know, that these, not, this, this cannot be something. This, this is not the barrier that is continually held up to be. Um, there are other issues in relation to that, of course, in terms of, um, you know, whether a woman wants to try and combine how long, how long they want to breastfeed for and whether they want to try and combine that with working and all of those things. But I think that it, it's very easy, for, and I'm certainly not suggesting you're doing this at all, but it's very easy for um, uh, employers, for example, or people like that to put to, to, to feel that, you know, a workplace couldn't support someone who might want to, um, you know, to, to be a breastfeeding worker. Um, again, it's it's also partly to do it. It also, it also ties in slightly to the earlier point that was being made about men in early years and men being positioned and very often sort of positioned primarily as a risk, whereas we know that's not the majority of men. And I just so I just think that you know the, these are all part of a discussion we really need to have. But I think that a society that really collectively wants to make um, and you know this sounds utopian but but wants to make a better place in which to live and in which kids can be raised by mothers or fathers who might also want to work more flexibly possibly from home we've certainly had you know a, a, a good go at that over the last 14 months or it's much longer whatever um you know so i, I think that there are all sorts of possibilities and that we that it's always important to counter any single thing that is presented as being the barrier so, um, but I really wish you well with your breastfeeding child. I'm babysitting my grandchild here this evening uh, on a baby monitor. So I'm also doing a bit of parenting, but um, so yeah, I think that it's really important that we just don't 
that that we you know so much of this stuff is is surmountable if we've got the will and the people who want to make it happen um and and uh, you know i mean that is slightly utopian and and it's all going to take time and all of those things but it's really good to be having a conversation about it thanks okay lovely what a great note to end on um utopian brilliant uh, all of the utopias um cool so thank you so much everyone particularly to the um amazing contributors but thanks to everyone for for joining tonight um like i say yeah get in touch if you're interested in the father figures project um or if you if you know someone it might be um and yeah thanks thanks so much it's been it's been really really fascinating and i hope you've all got something from the from the conversation can i just respond thank you very much sam just to the climate change question in chat i think that's i know we haven't got time sure. to cover that but go ahead i mean te yeah technically it's, it's only in one minute but go ahead if you want to well just i think go for it all of us need to be very positive about the future and the uh, change is slow so um, I hope we're all committed to creating a new generation of people who will think differently and, and come to some creative solutions for what's facing us. And our children are involved, you know, central to that. So, yes, a utopian future. Let's aim for that. Jeremy, any final words on that question? Uh, no, I, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay, lovely. Thanks so much, everyone. Take care. Thanks, Sam. Thanks.